Welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast, interdisciplinary conversations about new works in the broad world of business research. I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. If you like what you hear today, please consider subscribing to the podcast or sharing with others who might like it too. And if you have ideas for future episodes, let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Our guest today is John Coyle, professor of law at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. We'll be discussing his recent article, A Short History of the Choice of Law Clause, which is forthcoming in the University of Colorado Law Review. I'll add a link to the article in the show notes for today's episode. John, welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thank you for having me. So the choice of law clause is something that lawyers are very familiar with, but maybe aren't uh, terribly well acquainted with at the same time. It's in that boilerplate section of a standard agreement, but very important. It's the governing law of the contract. For some background, could you discuss uh, how choice of law provisions have emerged over the last few centuries? You note in the paper that U.S. courts have recognized in the 19th century uh, that this is an option between contracting parties. English courts recognized this option between contracting parties a bit before that. Uh, but they really began to be adopted in earnest only in the last 100 years or so. Could you trace some of that history and, and kind of how has this clause developed into something that is very boilerplate today? Yeah, sure, of course. So, so as you mentioned, um, I mean, you, you can find sort of what I would describe as proto-choice of law clauses in the 1760s in arbitration context, telling arbitrators to apply the rules and customs of London to a certain dispute. So you can find sort of things that look a little bit like these things, you know, in the in the 18th century. From a modern perspective, looking at the choice of law clause as it exists today, if you're tracing that back to sort of a original source, the ones that look recognizably modern, I really start seeing them just after the U.S. Civil War in the late 1860s. The earliest clause that I've been able to find that really sort of looks like a modern clause dates to about 1869. It was a lending agreement executed in Illinois. And then about five years later in 1874, I found another one in, in a prenuptial agreement, right? So these things <laughs> definitely have, have been around for, for quite some time. But what you really see, and again, it's, it's hard to figure this out, just as a matter of just finding sources, because, I mean, how do you find contracts executed hundreds of years ago to figure out, well, you know, what's in them? The way I found these, a little bit uh, unusual, I basically went through published cases. I went through published cases from the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, looking for references to anything that you recognize the choice of law clause, and that's where I found these, right? I found litigation about this lending agreement, litigation about this prenup, and that's where I'm finding these clauses. So it may be there, there are more out there before this date, and if there are, I would love to know about them, but just from when I was looking at this, published cases suggest that they began really showing up in earnest in the 1860s, and thereafter, in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, you start seeing them spread into contracts being used by companies doing extensive business across state lines. We're talking about life insurance companies, mortgage lenders, transportation companies. They're now doing business in this rapidly expanding U.S. economy after the war. They're now doing business across multiple jurisdictions, and to give themselves some certainty as to what the law is going to be governing their contracts, you see them start writing choice of law clauses into their agreements. That's interesting that we maybe first saw some instances of this in the U.S. in the domestic context, for example, in a, in a prenuptial agreement, and then we saw it in the commercial context. It our intuition almost might be that it would be the, the reverse of that. So that's an interesting observation that you've, you've found. So this is a topic that has been covered in, in literature before or the, the topic of choice of law clauses in general. What has some of the existing literature said and done? Uh, and what research questions did you have to add to that? And empirically, how did you go about answering those questions? So I would say most of the literature, so the literature I'm engaged, I'm sort of engaging with two different literatures on this, right? Um, on the one hand, I'm, I'm talking to the folks who write about conflict of laws, and the conflict of laws people are really interested in um, the enforceability of choice of law clauses, what they mean for conflicts of law analyses, things like that. And on the other hand, I'm, I'm really talking to the contract scholars, people who go back and read contracts from many years before, and then try and figure out what those clauses mean, how they changed over time, how should courts interpret them, and so on and so forth, right? It's a matter of methods, and it's a matter 
matter of sort of interest. It's really a hybrid paper that looks at both conflicts and contracts and tries to weave these two strands together. Looking at the contracts literature, I mean, you have lots of papers looking at different contract provisions. Perhaps the most famous are these papers about the Par Sioux Clause and sovereign debt agreements. These people like Stephen Choi, Michu Galati, you know, Bob Scott, people like that have written a lot about that provision and how courts should interpret it and what the words mean and the history. And so part of the paper is sort of nodding to that tradition. But again, a lot of people have written about choice of law clauses and when they're enforceable and when they're not and what courts should do with them and yada, yada, yada. Uh, and the paper is dealing with those folks as well. And I think that what it's really doing, though, sort of is distinctive that it's never really been done before, is that the contract people have never really focused on choice of law clauses as interesting contract provisions. And the conflicts people have been really interested in judicial decisions and legislation and scholarly commentary. But really, they've never focused in on the language in these contracts themselves. They've never actually looked at the text of the choice of law clause and tried to figure out, well, what do these things say? When are they showing up in contracts? Sort of what's the progression along those lines? So what I was trying to do here really is sort of essentially show the contracts people, hey, guys, look, there's this really interesting contract provision out there that can shed light on all these questions you're asking. It's the choice of law clause, and here's a bit of information about this. And then for the conflicts people, I was trying to say to them, hey, guys, look, you know, I appreciate everything you've done in these other areas. It's fantastic. But let's pay attention to the, to the contract, to the actual text of this provision that's accomplishing this goal and see what that can teach us about conflicts doctrine more generally. So that was kind of the, the literatures that are out there that I'm really talking to. In terms of methods, again, as I mentioned before, it's hard to find <laughs> contracts from, from very long ago, right? They, they're either locked away in vaults or they're stored on sort of archived hard drives. And so you really have a hard time figuring out, well, what's in these things? What are they? You know, what do they say? And so to try and figure that out, I, I sort of used two, two approaches. Um, the first, as I alluded to previously, I went through lots and lots of published cases with the aid of an army of research assistants looking for choice of law clauses that were mentioned in published cases over the last 150 years. And after years of searching, we looked at about 3,000 of those. Most of those are from the last couple of decades, from the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. But we found clauses from, as I said, the 1860s on forward, dozens in each decade going forward. The other thing that I did, methodologically, little bit interesting was I went through um, form books. So a form book is a book of contract kept in a lawyer's office. If a client came in and said, hey, I need to draft this particular contract, they could pull the form book off the shelf and look at it and then essentially you know, do the 19th century version of cut and paste and use that as a template for their agreement. And they have all these published books going back hundreds of years. And so I went and looked at all the form books from 1900, 1905, 1920, 1930, 1940, so on and so forth, to see at what point you see choice of law clauses showing up in these form books. And what's really interesting is you don't really see very many. They're, they're, they're out there. It's not that they're unknown, but there really aren't very many up until about 1960. And really in 1960, that's when you see a shift in the form books and all of a sudden, whereas previously there had been maybe 1%, 2% of the contracts in these books that have a choice of law clause, suddenly in the 1960s you're seeing 20 25% of these clauses showing up, which really marked, a, I think, a sea change and when the choice of law clause really kind of broke through and started to be used by people on a more widespread basis. And what what were some of the empirical results you found? You, you mentioned the the incidence of these clauses in, in form books, but is there a story there about the types of forms that had choice of law clauses, or is it just sort of an across the board that we start seeing these clauses be included in the forms? Yeah, so I, the honest answer is I don't know, right? I mean, I went through all the form books, and if the form books are an accurate indicator of contract practice, then I think this is a really interesting story here. Maybe the form books are completely misleading, right? It may be that, hey, what people were doing on the ground in no way resembles what was in the form books, and there's no really easy way to answer that question. So I think a premise I'm bringing into this research is that the form books are a reliable indicator of what people were actually doing in their contracts. And I think that you know there's reason to think that they are, but I'm happy to talk to folks who think that's just not a, a valid premise and explain why I think it is. But I think that if you're looking for why 1960, right? Why do you see this move in 1960? Again, it's speculative. I think, for me, what changed in 1960 was that the Uniform Commercial Code, which was first drafted in around 1952, it was extensively revised in 1956, and really states didn't begin adopting that code in earnest until around 1960. And in the Uniform Commercial Code, there is a specific provision that says, courts, thou shalt enforce choice of law clauses so long as the law selected bears a reasonable relationship to the parties in the transaction, right? So all of a sudden, up to this point, you've sort of had this, well, you know, these clauses enforceable, and most of the case law did that they were, but Joseph Beale, 
the drafter of the first restatement with sort of anti-choice of law clause. But but now, right about 1960, you have this, you know, statement being written into law across the United States. All these different states are saying now choice of law clauses are enforceable, which I argue, and again, it's speculative, but I think there's good reasons to think this is what happened, that that sort of served as a trigger to all of a sudden people were sort of motivated to start adding these things in. And ever since the 60s, it's just sort of been up and up and up. And I think recently there was a study that showed that about 75% of material contracts executed by public companies now contain a choice of law clause. So I guess there's a little bit of a, a question still lingering whether form books reflected practice on the ground and, and they were merely descriptive or if they were pushing the, the state of the art in, in a prescriptive way or if both the form books and the practice on the ground were being driven by developments on the, the UCC. Sure. Front. Yeah. And, again, and, and I, and the honest answer is I don't know for certain whether they were a leading indicator, whether they were a trailing indicator, were they an accurate indicator, were they an inaccurate indicator. I think a fundamental premise underlying my, my research in this area is that the form books are at least mostly reliable. And I think that I take some comfort in the fact. So one thing that I did to help you know, try and get myself comfortable with this was that I pulled a modern form book from 2019 <laughs> and went through that form book to try and see, okay, what percentage of clauses in this modern form book contain choice of law clauses? And in that, after doing that, there were a lot of contracts, things about a thousand contracts in there. About 69% of those contain choice of law clauses, which um, actually lines up, you know, not perfectly, but broadly accurately with studies of SEC contracts um, filed through Edgar, where there was a million contracts filed in the last 20 years, and it turns out 75% of those contain choice of law clauses. So, you know, the one place we can really test this, looking at the modern practice, form book one available through Lexis, a uh, recognized popular reform book, the contracts from the SEC, uh, data from the SEC contracts, they come up to the same broad conclusion of 69 versus 75. So I agree the form books are you know, not a perfect indicator for this, but again, if you're trying to figure out what contract practice looked like 100 years ago, there aren't a whole lot of options that are a whole lot better, unfortunately. I, I thought that the approach of using the, the form books was, was very interesting and novel, and I, it took me back to a job that I had in, in high school. I worked as a, a paralegal for a, a small firm in my hometown. I was in high school and, and college, and uh, there was a, a bookshelf that had all of the, the form books. And uh, sometimes when I would take the first stab at drafting something, I would go see if there was a form. So I hadn't really thought about those books uh, in, in a few years now, but <laughs> it was neat to sort of read about that. And I can imagine, you know, the, the beauty of the form books is they're not just about choice of law provisions, obviously. So maybe there's that's a methodology that might uh, be useful for uh, looking at other aspects. Yeah, of- I had I had a similar experience when I was in practice. The, the partner told me I had, there was like we had a client and they needed there was like a waste cleanup agreement. We had to clean up this particular site, and we had no <laughs> sort of standard firm forms on waste cleanup agreements. So I had to go pull a form book and adapt it to our purposes. So again. People still use these things, and so I'm hopeful that because they are used in this way now, hopefully they were being used in this way before, and that they're a broadly accurate measure of what people are actually doing. Yeah, I'm sure private law firms have a a lot of this uh, history sort of embedded in their their filing cabinets too. So it'd be wonderful if uh, they could somehow. Yeah, if only they would let us in to look at all their files, it would make things so much easier, right? <laughs> yeah, if they could, you know, somehow sanitize the confidential parts and uh, and sort of bring out the forms because law firms obviously have their own in-house forms that are adopted to different purposes. I, sure. I wonder if you could speak about some of the policy reactions both in the late uh, 19th century uh, on on up through the 60s. Uh, what were state legislatures and courts saying about these provisions, and maybe? Part of that is how did the transition between the first and second restatements maybe influence some of that thinking in, in the academy and, and, and state legislatures and courts? Um, sure, yes. The, the choice of law clause is being used in contracts beginning, say, in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. And they're showing up in litigation there as well. And the courts confronted with these clauses are essentially asked to make a, 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 decide a question of first impression, which is, are these clauses valid and enforceable? And for the most part, they held that they were, right? They're like, you know what? The Supreme Court has said that intent can be taken into account here, and the parties here clearly chose the law. We know what their intent was. So, you know what? We're, we're going to give effect to these things most of the time, right? We, we're going to hold out if there's like a public policy reason not to do it, or if the choice of law clause is trying to defeat some statute, local statute that says it has to be applied, you know, we're not going to let it do it in those situations. But generally speaking, the courts were 
open to the idea of enforcing choice of law clauses, you know, in the late 19th, early 20th century. What happened then is a really interesting story. So the field of conflict of laws is one of those fields where it's a little bit obscure and people don't know much about it. But the field is really dominated by these restatements published by the American Law Institute. And the first restatement of conflict of laws was prepared by a guy named Joseph Beale, who was the titan of the field. Um, he was a Harvard. He was the founding dean at the University of Chicago. He just sort of towered over the field for, for years and years. And Joseph Beale, for reasons that are, you know, sort of a little bit mysterious, he really didn't like the idea that the parties would get to choose their own law, right? He was really sort of philosophically opposed to that idea. And in his writings, he railed against choice of law clauses and the notion of party autonomy. And um, as it so happened, he was tapped by the American Law Institute to draft the first restatement of conflict laws. And in doing that, he really put his own policy preferences ahead of the actual reported cases, right? The reported cases, as I mentioned before, were pretty consistent saying, yeah, we're going to enforce these things most of the time. The first restatement basically wrote party autonomy out of conflict of laws, right? Made no mention of choice of law clauses, no mention of this notion that the party's intent mattered at all. It was all based on these, you know, mechanical factors. Where was the contract made? Where was the contract to be performed? Party intent just wasn't in there at all, right? Which arguably did not accurately restate the law at the time, as reflected in the case law, but Joseph Beale was Joseph Beale, and people sort of let him have, have it the way he wanted it, and that's what he did. So um, the, re- the first restatement of conflicts was published in 1934. The, like, just a couple of years later, the U.S. Supreme Court basically handed down a decision saying, by the way, we should be enforcing choice of law clauses. So there was sort of immediate evidence that maybe this restatement wasn't entirely accurate. But, you know, Joseph Beale was, was you know, a big, important guy. And there was this conflict between, well, do we go with the cases? Do we go with the restatement? Up until, I would say, the 1950s, when the dam finally broke, the UCC is saying, enforce these clauses. The second restatement of conflicts begins to be drafted in the early 50s. The drafters of the second restatement very clearly take the position that choice of law clauses should be enforceable. And when the second restatement is published in 1971, everything has changed, right? It's, two things are enforceable under most circumstances. Here are the exceptions, but generally we're going to give these effect. We're going to respect party autonomy. And that's sort of when this whole tableau sort of comes to a close. So, what you really have here is you have this sort of weird situation where consistently throughout this entire time period, from say 1900 to about 1970, the courts were pretty consistently enforcing choice of law clauses, but the academy, there was all these articles written in the academy saying, oh gosh, are these things really valid or they're not? But it was all settled, but really it was all, this entire debate was instigated by this one single guy, Joseph Beale, who for his own reasons didn't care much for these clauses. So um, again, it's an interesting story of where the, the professors and the, and the judges just really didn't seem, seem to see eye to eye for, for quite a long time. It's a, an interesting personal uh, story of uh, sort of one one academic against the tide, uh, and, and we're probably better off that he didn't have the, the final say on that issue. Uh, one interesting thing about this paper was delving into some of the, the shift in the terms of art that we see in the conflict of laws provisions over, over time, or maybe they're, they're almost talismans that you did in your empirical review. For, so, for example, you look at uh, the shift in these provisions using terms like construe or interpret or other than conflict of law principles thereof. Could you discuss that piece of, of the paper? Yeah, sure. So um, most people reading choice of law clauses, they all kind of blend together. They all look the same. But when you really dive into the case law and look at what these words mean, you discover that there's actually kind of an entire secret language of choice of law clauses, of which the average contract drafter, and frankly, the average law professor um, just has no idea it exists, right? So one issue is, so some clauses say this contract shall be governed by the laws of North Carolina. Some contracts say this contract shall be interpreted in accordance with the laws of North Carolina, and still others say this contract shall be construed in accordance with the laws of North Carolina. And so the question then becomes, well, so governed and interpreted and construed are all different words. Are these differences legally significant? Right? Did the parties mean something when they said interpreted instead of governed? And if so, what did they mean? So the courts have been struggling with these interpretive questions since the mid-1970s, as the choice of law clauses really began to proliferate. And generally speaking, most courts have said, no, 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 governed, interpret, construed, they all mean the same thing, right? Let's not get ahead of ourselves here. People just aren't paying that much attention to this. Come on, this is boilerplate. Let's just go with it. But a few courts said, oh, no, 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 contracts mean what the contracts say. And in choosing the interpretive law of North Carolina, well, sure, you chose the law of North Carolina related to contract interpretation, but you didn't choose 
all the contract law of North Carolina. To do that, you would have had to use the word govern, so we're going to read your choice of law clause really narrowly. Again, you can argue about what's the proper mode of interpretation, but there's no doubt that these linguistic differences have occasionally been deemed significant by the courts such that it really matters exactly what words are in the clause. Another example, and one you mentioned just a moment ago, you'll sometimes see clauses that say this contract shall be governed by the laws of New York. Or sometimes they'll say this contract shall be governed by the laws of New York without regard to conflict of laws principles. Now, the reason you add that language in is you don't want to choose the whole law of New York, including its conflict rules, because if under the conflict rules of New York, the case would be decided by the laws of Minnesota, well, now the court's applying the laws of Minnesota, even though you chose the law of New York in your choice of law clause, right? Most people don't intend that outcome. So even when a choice of law clause omits the phrase without regard to choice of law principles, um, the courts will generally read it in. But in one or two cases, the courts haven't done that. The courts have said, oh, well, you know what? They just said, choose the law of New York. That includes the conflict rules. So we're applying the law of Minnesota. Have a nice day. And you say, like, well, that doesn't seem quite right. And what's going on there? So again, there is this code. There is this secret language in these clauses that if you are ignorant of the case law, if you don't really know all this, and frankly, most people don't, because really, who on God's green earth wants to spend all their time reading case law, interpreting choice of law clauses, right? Like, I think this is really interesting, but most people think, keep me away from that. But it turns out that this stuff matters, and this stuff is important, and if you know the code, and if you know the rules, then you're on solid ground, you know exactly what you're getting, and if you don't know the rules, you don't know the code, you may not address an issue in your contract, and down the road, that may come back to haunt your client. Now, again, the lawyers who draft the contract are almost never the lawyers who litigate the cases, so you know, say it's somebody else's problem. But it turns out the feedback loop doesn't work very well here either, right? That somehow the litigators all know these tricks, but they somehow never tell their corporate partners that they need to revise their language. And so as a result, you get all of these clauses <laughs> that are part of these form agreements being endlessly replicated, containing these words that are probably not ideally written for the client's interests, but no one can be allowed to change them and nothing ever really seems to change. So one thing I wanted to look at in this paper was, well, have things changed? And it turns out in a few areas, things have changed, right? The proportion of choice of law clauses that you contain the word govern, this contract shall be governed by the laws of such and such, has increased markedly over the last 30 or 40 years. We're talking it went from 40% in 1940 to about 73% now. So it's, it's definitely increased quite a bit. So you do see change, right? You do see slow, halting, glacial-like change, but in some cases you do see changes on this front. And that's a useful change, right? I think clarifying whether govern versus interpret, that's actually something that can matter. But you'll see changes that are kind of hard to explain, right? I mean, again, carving out the conflict rules, right? Saying without regard to conflict principles, that's sensible in some level. But in my research, there's only two courts in the history of the Republic that have ever held that distinction to be meaningful. So you probably don't really need to add that in or it shouldn't be your highest priority. And yet over the last, between 1970 and 2000, the proportion of clauses that contain that language went from essentially zero to about 20%. So you're seeing these changes happen sometimes and not in other times. And you're sort of wondering why this does and why this doesn't happen. And it's really, really hard to explain. But again, looking at hundreds of even thousands of clauses over time, you can see gradual shifts in the words being used. And these shifts sometimes reflect sort of difference in meaning and sometimes they reflect drift and random mutations and things like that. But that's essentially what I found. One of my uh, hypotheses I might offer for some of that shift is that uh, people who know that they're going into corporate law uh, or law students who know that they're going into corporate law, conflict of laws is often not at the top of their, their list in terms of courses <laughs> to pick. And, what are you talking and, about? Isn't, isn't conflict of laws everybody's favorite class? I, I don't I, know. You know I, this is, this is you know, I enjoyed it. And whenever I've, I've talked to particularly summer associates who are going into their third year I and they're going into corporate law, I encourage them to take conflict of law uh, I think it has a lot of applicability to corporate practice, but a lot of people don't see see my point there. So that that might be part of it. So I, I've who who's your who's your professor for conflict of law? Uh, Stephen Sachs at Duke Law. Uh, gr oh, great, sure, yeah. great class and, and great professor. He posts his exams on conflict of laws to Facebook after he gives them, and those are some crazy exams. Yeah, it it was it was the most fun you could you could have talking about uh, <laughs> Renoir. I, I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it was a it was a good class and. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed by the sheer amount of energy and, and time he devotes to them. Like it's, it's just it's just mind-boggling how how detailed they are.
Uh, d- definitely great, great class. And any any law students who might be listening who are thinking of going into to corporate law should definitely give conflict of law a, a good consideration uh, for for at least their three L year. So I've referred to these choice of law provisions with a little bit of a pejorative term. I've, I've referred to them as part of the boilerplate section of a, a long contract. But I wondered if you could discuss how this research fits into the existing literature on how innovative contract provisions first emerge and then become widely adopted. Uh, you can imagine at some point, choice of law provisions were at the contractual cutting edge, but now they've sort of been relegated to the boilerplate. So how does the innovative become common uh, and routine over time? That's really interesting. So, so as it relates to the choice of law clause, I, I am I'm reasonably confident that this move from the periphery to the cutting edge has happened, I think, around 1960. That's when the shift really, so you see it showing up in the form books. There was almost certainly some policy entrepreneur, some ambitious corporate lawyer who really made a point of pushing this thing home, right? I, I'm confident there was someone out there who was doing this behind the scenes. I can't find who that person was, right? I, I just, it's just hard to reconstruct this from so far in the future, right? Like, what drove this? And the honest answer is, I don't know what happened in this case that made the choice of law clause sort of become popular, right? Once it sort of caught on, I can see, you know, just, just sheer drift sort of leading to more and more clauses containing it because it's objectively useful. It's a good thing to have. Once you get 20% saturation, right, just every new contract you're going to draft is going to have a clause in it, and all the old contracts are going to keep them. So over time, you'll see that, you know, the number will increase just by just attrition as old forms get weeded out. But in terms of the mechanics, I honestly don't know. I've got another paper I'm, I've been working on recently looking at sort of more specifically at this issue, like what triggers moments of innovation, right? What triggers these things happening, and it seems so random, right? It's kind of like, why did the fidget spinner become this incredibly popular toy, right? Why did the Rubik's Cube become incredibly popular in the 80s? It's very hard. Why did, why did the particular song become popular? You know, sometimes you can predict it and sort of explain it, and sometimes you honestly can't. Call Me Maybe? I mean, what's that song about? I don't know, right? But it was really, really popular. And I think there's a certain amount that's also true for choice of law clauses and for contract provisions more generally. So, you can come up with a theory that maybe explains part of the phenomenon, but again, like any innovation, there's all these random factors that can drive it or hold it back. And I don't know the full story for the choice of law clause. I do know there was a really, really interesting article written about form selection clause. There was, uh, I guess, Wilson Sonsini and Joseph Grunfest out at Stanford. Um, they were doing some deal back in the like, late 90s, early 2000s, where they put like a, a form selection bylaw into a corporate charter or corporate bylaws. So they say, hey, look, you know, if we're going to litigate, we have to go here. And they forgot about it, right? They literally like forgot they had put it in there and life went on. And years later, Grunfest went back and looked and it turns out their random form selection bylaw had become the basis. Hundreds of other form selection bylaws that people had sort of wrote into their own corporate organizational documents through absolutely no publicizing efforts on the part of Grunfest or Wilson Sonsini, they literally didn't know this had happened until they looked back and realized it had come to pass. So, you know, sometimes people flog contract language, want to get it done, and nothing happens. Sometimes people write a provision in and it gets picked up and used. So, again, this is all kind of interesting and mysterious, and I don't have a great explanation for why choice of law clauses sort of came onto the scene and then, you know, took over. But I also don't have a good explanation for how other contract language did the same. These are great questions, and I just don't know. (laughs) That's fair enough. John, what takeaways would you like listeners to have from this paper, whether they're academics or practicing lawyers or or maybe law students who are considering what classes they want to take? Yeah, sure. So I'll start with practicing lawyers, right? If you're a practicing lawyer listening to this, first of all, God bless you. Second of all, really, when you are going through your contracts, please, please, please pay careful attention to your choice of law clauses. Go to my website, read the paper about how to interpret choice of law clauses, read this paper on the history of choice of law clauses, right? It's not that it's not that bad. And you can really learn some useful tips to make sure your choice of law clause really is drafted so you know what you're getting and there are no unpleasant surprises for your clients down the road. Uh, if you're an academic listening to this, I think from an academic, uh, the two most important takeaways here. The first is this methodology. I think that studying how contracts and contract language evolve and change over time is really interesting and sort of not a lot of people were doing that type of research. Um, and I would encourage you to at least consider projects in this vein. 
And if you're going to do that, I think that the two ways to methodologically find these things is one, via the form book. And second, is going through published cases to the extent you can, looking for examples of the language in these clauses and seeing how these things have evolved and changed over time. So methodologically, I think studying contracts in this way has a lot to add. Um, and if you're a contract scholar, I think that recognizing that the process of contract evolution in the choice of law clause context may be very different than the process by which other contractual provisions evolve and change, right? Thinking about the par and pursue clause or various provisions in bond indentures, you know, those things change and there's a, definitely a dynamic in those changes. And those dynamics sometimes look like, and sometimes they don't look like, the changes here in the choice of law clause. And if you're a law student listening to this, what I would say to you is essentially conflict of laws is a course that is very hard to understand, right? It's really a lawyer's course for lawyers, and people who aren't lawyers find it all kind of perplexing. But if you think you're going to be going into either litigation or corporate work, I think I completely agree with Andrew that there's a lot of useful insights to be gleaned from this area. And I think it will give you a leg up on other folks. In the corporate sphere, you'll understand what these provisions are all about. These boilerplate dispute resolution clauses, you'll get them in a way that you wouldn't have necessarily got them but for this course. But if you're litigating and making all these decisions about where to sue, you know, where can you get your personal jurisdiction? What are the choice of law rules, the governing jurisdiction, and you know, where is that going to take you? Can you enforce a judgment on the back end? These are all really important questions for a litigator to know about and to think about. And um, conflict of laws gives you a great place to sort of work through those issues in law school. Our guest today has been John Coyle, Reef C. Ivey II, Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. We've discussed his recent article, A Short History of the Choice of Law Clause, which is forthcoming in the University of Colorado Law Review. I'll include a link to the article in the show notes for today's episode. John, thank you for joining the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thanks so much, Andrew. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Business Scholarship Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing to the podcast or leaving a rating on your favorite podcast app, or let other people know about it too. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. Andrew Jennings.